This is Michael Moak for the Data Science Association on Monday, January 27th, 2014. This is our inaugural podcast. This is something new we're trying. For all those who uh, commute out there and don't want to listen to the uh, talking heads, just uh, fill up time and waste your time. Or if you're on the treadmill, this is a good alternative to watching CNN with no sound. Um, these are going to be unrehearsed for now, at least for now. Uh, not as not as valuable as if I had actually prepared something, but uh, I'm basically just going to surf the web for you while you can't, while you're in your car or while you're on your treadmill. And so I'm just going to go through uh, news items. And on, on Mondays, um, as you probably know, the Data Science Association publishes um, weekly news. So on Mondays I'm going to cover the weekly news from the Data Science Association and then on the other days I'll cover uh, other blogs and um, you know, it may not just be me. <laughs> uh, the, the, there may be some variety to the podcast. We may have interviews. Uh, if we're pressed for time to prepare a podcast we may just run a news article through a text-to-speech um, and we also invite vendors to uh, submit their own podcasts, you know, learn about products related to uh, big data or data science. So I'm going to just get started. Um, I'm going to read the headlines uh, for this week's news on Data Science Association. First headline, Scientific Thinking in Business, Google Cloud Storage Connector for Hadoop. Adventures in Optimizing Text Processing, Seeking Edge Websites Turn to Experiments, Cleaning Up Science, Crisis of Big Science, Software that Augments Human Thinking, Problems with Big Data and Tips to Get Value, The Power to Decide, Big Data Arrives on UK Balance Sheets, Big Data, the Management Revolution. LinkedIn offers college choices by the numbers. Facebook's deep learning guru reveals the future of AI. Why the supernova, why the new supernova is so important to scientists. Well, as you may know, I recently posted a blog on the Data Science Association blog page called Science Data Science, so applying data science to science is an interest of mine. So I'm going to drill down to these two topics on science. So I'm going to click on cleaning up science. And this is uh, an article in the New Yorker. A lot of scientists have been busted recently for making up data and fudging statistics. One case involves a Harvard professor who I once knew and worked with, another a Dutch social psychologist who made up results by the bushel. So let's see what the proposed solution here is. I skim this. Even if cases of scientific fraud and misconduct were simply ignored, my field would still be in turmoil. Ah, solutions. Restructure the incentives in science. For many reasons, science has become a race for the swift, but not necessarily the careful. Grants, tenure, and publishing all depend on flashy, surprising results. Uh, next solution, encourage people to publish studies that fail, as well those that succeed. This actually kind of goes to the point I made in the uh, Data Science Association forum uh, debate, forum slash debate that we had a couple months ago, um, where we were discussing that only the best uh, results get published. And uh, to, to really apply data science, you have to consider successes and failures. Thomas Edison realized that the key to inventing a light bulb was to keep track of every experiment that didn't work. But few journals nowadays are willing to publish efforts that don't yield immediate fruit. And young scientists who lack immediate success rarely get grants. Third solution. Recognize that no single study ever proves anything. Without replication, all results should be taken as preliminary. Here, both science and the media are complicit. There is a tendency to trumpet every new finding as if it proves something. But most new studies are merely evidence toward a conclusion, not the conclusion itself. Fourth proposed solution, promote meta-analysis. This technique combines results across many different labs that allow researchers to sort between tiny but consistent effects that are hard to see in individual studies and spurious effects that occurred by accident. 
The Cochrane Collaboration's meta-analytic reviews have become a vital part of evidence-based medicine. Okay, I wasn't aware that meta-analysis was so powerful. Create an ethical code. Hippocrates is right. Every profession needs formal standards of conduct. And of course, this is a time where we can plug the Data Science Association Code of Conduct. The sixth proposed solution, give science some cops. As bitter experience has shown, even the most elite can turn out to be cheats. Business had its made-offs. Science has its own set of high flyers whose work is too good to be true. All right. So these are sort of um, um, meat space ways to clean up science, not technology-based. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to go to that article, Crisis of Big Science. I didn't realize science was in crisis. We'll find out. So this is uh, an article in the New York Review of Books. Last year, physicists co commemorated the centennial discovery of the atomic nucleus. Okay. Um, this was great science. Okay. So Rutherford identified this as the nucleus of the atom around which electrons revolve like planets around the sun. This was great science, but not what one would call big science. Rutherford's experimental team consisted of one postdoc and one undergraduate. Their work was supported by a grant of just 70 pounds from the Royal Society of London. The most expensive thing used in the experiment was the sample of radium, but Rutherford did not have to pay for it. The radium was on loan from the Austrian Academy of Sciences. Nuclear physics soon got bigger. The electrically charged particles, okay. Uh, after World War II, new, new accelerators were built. Um, by the mid-1970s, the work of experimentalists at these laboratories and of theorists using the data that were gathered had led us to a comprehensive and now well verified theory of particles and forces. Uh, as successful as the standard model has been, it is clearly not the end of the story. Uh, all right, what is the point of the story? So the next decade, physicists are probably going to ask their governments for support for whatever new and more powerful accelerator, accelerator we then think will be needed. This is going to be a very hard sell. Uh, all right, page two. This is all longer article than I expected. I was not scrolling fast enough. We wait for the page to load. All right. Um, all these problems will emerge again when physicists go to their governments for the next accelerator beyond the LHC. So this seems to be more like funding of science rather than anything specific to data science. Big science is in competition for government funds, not only with manned spaceflight and with various programs of real science, but also with many things that we need government to do. Okay, all right. Let us go on to another story. Uh, Facebook's deep learning guru reveals the future of AI. New York University professor Yan Lukan has spent the last 30 years exploring artificial intelligence, designing deep learning computing systems that process information in ways not unlike the human brain. Brain, and now he's bringing this work to Facebook. Uh, well, skipping uh, with deep learning, Facebook could automatically identify faces in the photographs you upload, automatically tag them with the right names. Yeah, yeah. Um, in some ways, Facebook and AI is a rather creepy combination. Oh, by the way, I didn't say what this is. This is from Wired, by the way. Um, this week, Lacan is at Neural Information Processing Systems Conference in Lake Tahoe, the annual gathering of the AI community where Zuckerberg and company announced his hire. But he took a short break from the conference to discuss his new project with Wired. We have edited the conversation for reasons of clarity and length. Wired, we know you're starting an AI lab at Facebook, but what exactly will you and the rest of your AI cohorts be, work be working on? Lacan, well, I can tell you all about the purpose and the goal of the new organization. It's to make significant progress in AI. We want to do two things. One is to really make progress from a scientific point of view from the side of technology. Okay. What might that technology look like? What might it do? 
we're kind of, the set of technologies that we'll be working on is essentially anything that can make machines more intelligent. More particularly, that means things that are based on machine learning. The only way to build intelligent machines these days is to have them crunch lots of data models and build models of that data. The particular set of approaches that have emerged over the last few years is called deep learning. It's been extremely successful for applications such as image recognition, speech recognition, and a little bit for natural language processing, although not to the same extent. Those things are extremely successful mm -hmm. right now. Okay. The science, why are the science at the heart of this is actually quite old, isn't it? People like you and Jeff Hinton, who's now at Google, first developed these deep learning methods known as backpropagation algorithms in the mid-1980s. Um, well, actually, I'm going to digress here personally. Um, uh, Hinton, I believe it was Hinton, somebody in 2006 figured out how to uh, make the backpropagation algorithm uh, much, much faster and uh, more practical for multi-layer neural networks, uh, whereas previously they were only practical for a single layer, and that's why the neural networks that we knew in the 1980s weren't uh, very powerful. So that's my personal interpretation and understanding. Let's see what Wiccan says. That's the root of it, but we've gone way beyond that. Backpropagation allows us to do what's called supervised running. I haven't heard of that. So you have a collection of images together with labels, and you can train the system to map new images to labels. This is what Google and Baidu are currently using for tagging images and user photo collections. That we know works, but then you have things like video and natural language, for which we have very little label data. We can't just show a video and ask a machine to tell us what's in it. Uh, so what we do is use the structure of the video to help the system build a model. It requires us to invent new algorithms, new unsupervised learning algorithms. This has been a very active area of research within the deep learning community. Okay. How do you explain wired? How do you explain the difference between deep learning and ordinary machine learning? A lot of people are familiar with the sort of machine learning that Google did over the first tens of its life, where it would analyze large amounts of data in an effort to say automatically identify web spam. That's relatively simple machine learning. There's a lot of effort that goes into creating those machine learning systems in the sense that the system is not able to really process raw data. The data has to be turned into a form that the system can digest. That's called a feature abstractor. Take an image, for example. You can't feed the raw pixels into a traditional system. You have to turn the data into a form that the classifier can digest. This is what a lot of computer vision a lot of the computer vision community has been trying to do for the last 20 or 30 years, trying to represent images in the proper way. And by the way, I'm going to digress here again. Um, there are actually some significant breakthroughs within the last 10 years in the computer vision um, field. You know, previous, you know, when I was going to college, it was all about moments. And now they have feature extractors for images, um, and they're implemented for free for you. Uh, in in the OpenCV library, uh, you can just get a vector. You just feed it, feed OpenCV an image. You can get a vector back, actually a vector of vectors of um, where where each individual vector uh, uh, describes feature points um, for that for that image, and then you can compare. Um, the feature points correspond to a particular feature on the image. So an image may have multiple features. Each feature has its own feature vector. And then you can uh, compare those features to other images, such as sequential frames uh, in a video stream. Um, okay, But what deep learning allows us to do is learn this representation process as well, instead of having to build the system by hand for each new problem. Uh, a lot of the limitations of AI to, that we see today are due to the fact we don't have good representations for the signal. That's it? All right. Okay, so I guess the summary of that story is Facebook is doing deep learning and it's scary that they're doing it. Uh, okay. What else is in the news today? Oh, look, we only have seven minutes left. I'm trying to keep these two um, 20 minutes each, and of course, remember our website, 
data science assn.org, data science association.org, data science assn.org. Um, Seeking Edge Websites Turn to Experiments. This is at technologyreview.com. The subtitle is Optimization Technologies Reshaping Publishers' Decision-Making Process and the Web Itself. 1-800-DENTIST is a small company facing a big decision. What picture on its web homepage will get the most people to fill out a form with their names and phone numbers? Mm -hmm. At many web publishers, such decisions can lead to impassioned arguments, fruitless debates, even hurt feelings. But 1-800-DENTIST doesn't leave it to chance or opinion. Instead, it runs an experiment. It watches two or more versions of a web page and then watches as users react. Okay, so basic A-B testing here. Let's scroll through this and see if there are any unique insights. Ah, there's a nice chart. Uh, seeking perfection, more websites run experiments. So this is a chart, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013. Percentage of the top 10,000 websites that use A-B testing technology. So in 2010, it was less than 4%. 2011, less than 8%. Uh, 2012, which is about 9%. And 2013, about 13%. So it's, uh, it's growing. Uh, there... Oh, but there are risks to following the data. It can turn into a tyranny of mob taste that diminishes the judgment of professionals or artists. In 2009, a top Google designer named Douglas Bowman quit, complaining that the company couldn't decide between two blues, so they're testing 41 shades to see which one performs better. I, I've, I've heard that one before. Uh... Now, anyone with the data can make the call, says Rush, and that is very frightening for a lot of organizations. Traditional media companies, in particular, aren't ready. Often, publishers don't have clear objectives with editors, designers, and advertising salespeople, each advocating different aims. Without a clear goal, says Rush, software is not going to help you. Uh... But A-B testing is spreading because it's become easy to do. Well, that's news to me. Op Optimizely says it can pick a winning design after as few as 100 visits for sites that have never been optimized. In practice, running experiments is often much harder. Okay. At 1-800-DENTIST, which is based in Los Angeles, uh, Carcats Car says he's testing text and images for several slightly different landing pages and estimates he will need 150,000 visitors to each in order to detect a difference. That could take months, he says. All right, let's go on to a different story. We only have four minutes left. Um, actually, uh, let's skip over to another news source. Let's go over to Twitter. I actually am new to Twitter, believe it or not. I was a diehard Facebook fan, and I augmented that with the, the LinkedIn um, group discussions, which are actually still very, very good, but ever since Facebook started editing the news feed, it's become not very useful. Uh, when I subscribe to something, I want to get everything. Um, so, I, I, you know, in my opinion, I consider the Facebook notion of publish subscribe to be broken. Um, there are a lot of surprisingly good tweeters uh, on uh, big data and data science. Um, so uh, I'm just going to scroll through here. Um, this is a good uh, graph that uh, Kirk Bourne posted. Uh, I'm going to expand this here. Uh, this is the growth of different types of databases over the past year, since January 2013 to January 2014. And uh, the big winner here is Graph Databases. That has grown um, by more than double. It's um, more than 250% what it was in January 2013. So there, uh, this graph uses 100% in January 2013 as the benchmark. And so the January 2014 numbers are all relative to that 100% uh, percent in January 2013. Uh, all the different types of databases have grown with the exception of uh, relational databases. That you know, eyeballing looks like it's around 95% of what it was a year ago. 
uh, after uh, the big win from graph uh, databases, uh, the next one are the wide column stores at uh, about 215-220% wide column. That would be the HBase uh, or Cassandra um, or as John Daudry in Denver here likes to proclaim Accumulo, the uh, not uh, very well known but powerful wide column store. Uh, document stores come up next at 175. Uh, RDF stores, I, I didn't even know there was anything specific to RDF in terms of databases. Uh, key value stores, native XML, these are all about 175. Um, then we get below 150. Search engines, object-oriented databases have grown. I thought they were on, their, on, the, on the way out. Uh, that uh, OO database is running it at 130. Uh, Multi-value DBMS. Hmm, I'm not familiar with that technology. Uh, that is running at 120. All right, one more tweet, and then I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, let's see what we have here. Uh, another online MS degree. I wonder how much this one is. This is also posted by Kirk Bourne. And I'm trying to expand this photo here. I guess I better just want to look at it in line. Um, uh, UMUC. I wonder which what that expands out to. Oh, University of Maryland, University College, Master of Science in Data Analytics. And is this really online? I'm looking. I don't know. This kind of looks like uh, this kind of looks like in person. These are just um, a lot of regular classes, it looks to me. I could be wrong. Uh, go, and, go and investigate it yourself. Don't take my word for it. So the overall degree requirements, uh, UCSP 615, orientation to graduate studies at UMUC, required main courses, Data 600 Foundation and Data Analytics, Data 610 Decision Management Systems. This is kind of interesting if they actually have a four-letter course code called Data. That's uh, promising. Data 620, data management and visualization. Data 630, data mining. Data 640, predictive modeling. Data 650, big data analytics. Required practicum, practicum course. Data 670, data analytics practicum. You can do a dual degree option with an MBA. All right. Well, time's up for today. Uh, join us tomorrow. Thank you.